Okay, so it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our next speaker, Andrei Savchenko from HEC, uh, Nizhny Novgorod. Uh, okay, it's from, uh, from uh, I tried to, to translate Nizhny Novgorod into English, but when I realized that it should be Nizhny Novgorod. <laughs> okay, so from, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah from, from Nizhny Novgorod, and uh, Andrei uh, will speak about uh, computer vision on mobile devices. So, Andrei. Yeah. Very much. So thank you, organizer. thanks organizers for inviting me, and um, uh, I'm great for everyone who is <laughs> still here uh, in this um, evening. Yep, and um, my talk will be uh, more related to school. I mean, it's not something uh, really theoretical from some top conference and some top results. I will just show you some examples of uh, that I with my team. I we worked on uh, real. Um, projects uh, devoted to computer vision, to using computer vision algorithms on mobile devices. And uh, I'll show you some examples. I, I, I will share, I, I hope uh, I, I will, uh, I, I will provide you all, all my presentation, by, but let's, uh, let's take a look at our time. So um, actually I will speak mostly about offline mobile uh, computer vision. Uh, so, uh, because for sure it's uh, possible to send some image to remote server and process them as we uh, um, used to do. Uh, but uh, right now uh, we are focusing on offline uh, processing, so when you, you uh, process images uh, directly on your device. Yeah? And um, actually, so we don't uh, speak here about cloud computing or so, something like this. And um, actually, uh, we, when we just uh, want to start, uh, so we, let's, let's imagine that you have brilliant, uh, maybe state-of-the-art model of, I don't know, uh, image classification in some particular task. And you say, okay, um, uh, so I, I want to uh, implement this model on mobile device and share it in my own mobile application for everyone. And uh, you will uh, probably think about several issues that you will, um, that you may, uh, may found during your um, development of this application. Uh, so first of all, it's speaking about memory usage. Yeah, so we are not expected that we have a very large device. Uh, for sure, and that's why probably you think about memory. Uh, so maybe you, uh, you analyze that your vision transformer is uh, really large uh, to fit in the memory of a mobile device. But still, uh, if we speak about some top uh, devices, uh, we should say that uh, there are plenty of um, uh, memory uh, for many models, not maybe large ensembles, but something something smart enough. Yeah, so it's still, so it's an issue, but it's not the main issue here. Um, also, for sure, we will uh, think about computational complexity. Uh, if you have, uh, I don't know, 1,000 of layers, then probably you will see some issues in implementing it. But still, uh, if you speak about some smart, uh, lightweight models, uh, they work uh, more or less um, with the same time, uh, inference time, compared to some laptops, for example, without uh, GPUs. And uh, if your device has a GPU, then probably you are even faster uh, than uh, some laptop without GPU. Yeah, uh, but what, uh, what's important here, um, first of all, uh, so if we speak about any mobile application, we should say that it's uh, limited by some size. Yeah, and uh, so you cannot, um, so if, uh, even if uh, you have uh, enough memory to store your model, uh, you are limited by the size of your binary file, and if, if you want to, uh, um, to, 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 to sell your, uh, your file, your binary file, uh, together with your model, you are still limited by uh, some, some sizes. And also, I should say that uh, it's, uh, you are limited by the size of uh, um, special libraries that you use here. And uh, so, for example, the um, PyTorch Lite uh, library has um, recently merged, and uh, when it's uh, the first version was about uh, 30 uh, megabytes, right now it's uh, something like 50 megabytes, so plus 20 megabytes, it's um, huge. 
um, and, uh, from, from mobile point of view. So you still uh, need to think about memory. Uh, for sure, you need to think about power um, con consumption. So even if it's possible to run your model uh, in real time to process videos, or I don't know, something like this, uh, so your user will be a bit disappointed if uh, they run your application and uh, after 10 minutes uh, they say that, okay, my smartphone <laughs> is, uh, so you, you have to charge your battery. So, it's, uh, so you can use your application and device, but it won't be mobile. Yeah, and uh, for sure there are some issues for the first developers because it's, um, so I will focus on Android applications, but for sure the same is for iOS. So uh, there is no uh, Python, there is no uh, plenty, uh, plenty of uh, libraries that we used to uh, apply in our uh, Jupyter Notebooks uh, don't work here. So you need to switch to Java, Kotlin, uh, Objective-C, uh, C++ or something like this uh, without any uh, library, so you still uh, struggle from, um, from the miss of uh, important libraries. Uh, so um, here I just show you some examples of how, how to do it with uh, PyTorch Lite or with, uh, I don't know, with uh, TensorFlow Lite. It's just example. Again, I, I said that I can share the presentation for everyone, but uh, it's very easy to find the um, uh, to find some examples. Uh, actually, it's really easy. Uh, speaking about PyTorch, it's really easy. So if you have a model, it's uh, several uh, several lines of code just to convert it to PyTorch Lite format, uh, to uh, to load the model uh, from uh, by using the library, to load the image and uh, convert it, uh, apply some transformations, uh, to uh, run the inference, and also to get the result. So that's all. Actually, it's really simple. So it's for for sure. It's uh, so it's actually it's for any uh, for for any model. You feed the image, you get the results. Uh, if it's uh, image uh, image recognition, object rec object detection, uh, image segmentation, and so on and so forth. So everything is more or less uh, the same. So and uh, that's all. Um, actually, unfortunately, right now. Uh, there are some issues with PyTorch Lite. It uh, doesn't work on, uh, on GPUs of mobile devices, and actually its uh, uh, latency on CPU is uh, twice uh, uh, greater when compared to work with TensorFlow Lite. Uh, yeah, and so if you are really uh, curious about uh, how to implement your model uh, um, the more, in the most efficient way, you have to switch to TensorFlow Lite because it's a um, much more developed library for now. Um, I don't speak about the next year maybe, but for now. Uh, so uh, f in this case, uh, yeah, it's still possible that you will have to convert your model from PyTorch to uh, TensorFlow. It's, uh, so in one of my projects, we have to do it and we increase the running time in, I don't know, in four times. So it works to do, but uh, still uh, some work, and uh, for sure, uh, uh, TensorFlow Lite comes from TensorFlow 1, not even TensorFlow 2 with Keras, so it's uh, much more, uh, so you need to, uh, uh, you, you need to write much more code, but again, it's uh, that, uh, something like copy-paste, so there are some processing uh, with uh, efficient uh, processing of buff buffers, with efficient uh, pre-processing of images by your own without uh, any uh, interesting functions or and, uh, something like this. But still, it's, uh, it's more or less the same. So again, it, uh, you, you need to implement it once time, and after that, you can apply it for every model that you, work, uh, you want to work with, um, with images on your mobile device in offline mode. Uh, so uh, let me show you some result from my project with Samsung uh, about uh, uh, implementing some image understanding on mobile devices. Uh, so the task was to generate user profile based on the gallery of photos on your device. So you can imagine that, uh, so I hope that everyone have uh, some smartphone uh, in this audience and maybe you enjoy making photos of, you, of what you like or maybe in some case what you don't like. Uh, yeah, so maybe you are very interested in visiting this conference and you play and you made 
a lot of photos of all speeches um, before <laughs> before mine. Yeah, and uh, in that case, maybe in your conference, uh, so you you have a plenty of, of photos with uh, some lectures, conferences, and uh, it's possible to. Uh, to understand, uh, to process your photos and uh, predict that you are some student or uh, professor in uh, some university. Yeah, so it's uh, one, uh, one scenario. Also, maybe you enjoy making, making photos of, I don't know, of some food like pizza, pasta, I don't know, Chinese, Japanese food or something like this. So maybe, uh, so if you, if you have plenty of such kind of uh, photos, uh, it's possible to, um, automatically understand your profile, so you are interested in Chinese uh, cuisine, and uh, when you visit the new city, it's possible to make some recommendations for you. So it's something like uh, uh, trying to avoid cold start problems for, uh, for recommender systems. You gather uh, the, uh, the profile of user interests just by analyzing of the photos on the gallery without any sending of uh, to remote server, so by processing them directly on your device. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so you, you can do some uh, nice recommendations. And actually, uh, the, the, there are plenty of users' interests, uh, food, uh, sports, uh, I don't know, museums, walk, children, pets, um, cars, and so on. So you need to, so it's, uh, uh, it's a rather large uh, profile. Uh, so in our project, it was more than, I don't know, 500 different categories, something like this. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, so it's in general, it's uh, assumed that it, all the processing will be done by your mobile device without any remote server, but still maybe it's possible to process some kind of public photos. I mean, public, uh, so you walk in uh, Moscow, I don't know, in Nizhny Novgorod, for example, you come to uh, one of the conference, you make some photos of uh, some interesting places, and um, there are now some, uh, some private uh, information about you, your friends, and maybe it's uh, in, the, in this scenario it's possible to process them on remote server, but uh, in general it's assumed that most uh, photos are private with your faces, with some scanned documents or something like this, and so you have to work uh, directly on your device. So this is some pipeline uh, so that's published in uh, the Pattern Recognition Journal. Uh, I, I, I don't think believe that it's a time to uh, work on it. It's just some processing of, uh, so it's a mixture of scene recognition, object detection, face recognition, um, some OCR for uh, understanding scanned documents or something like this. Yeah, and uh, after that, after all, you get some profile of interest and the profile is just a counter of categories presented in your photos. Um, there is some interesting, uh, approach there how to uh, recognize complex events in your photos and we just mixed some uh, repre visual representation of uh, each photo by mixing the scores, embeddings of some scene recognition model and also some parts of objects detected at this model and we showed that it's possible to improve the accuracy of event recognition here. Uh, yeah, again, I will skip uh, this, uh, uh, this document. Also, it, what's important in processing your gallery is that you make your photos sequentially. So you, uh, maybe you are, inter you are walking in the street and you make some uh, photos of, of uh, uh, interesting places. Yeah, and uh, maybe you visit the stadium and you made, uh, again, several photos of, uh, uh, of, uh, of your football match. So you can combine uh, the sequential photos together and predict better the uh, some the, the the event, the scene, uh, some objects or something like this. So we again we provided some algorithm how to combine them. It's uh, some sequential processing with some neural attention and uh, something like this. Uh, I just say that uh, yeah, it's still. Uh, important to process sequential photos. I mean, uh, so it's not a set of random photos with random uh, order. It's uh, still a sequence of photos, so you can uh, use it. And here are some screen uh, shots from our very, uh, very simple demo application, how it works. So you have a high-level profile. Uh, you have a low-level profile for each category, like outdoor, indoor, demography, 
and something like this. So it's uh, there are some face recognition, face detection, or something like this. So it's, it was done three years ago, actually. Uh, yeah, and uh, for, uh, as I said, for Samsung. Uh, in our paper, we provided some examples of how to, uh, how to gather and how to process uh, real uh, profiles of some uh, uh, celebrities or even some groups of celebrities, something like this. Uh, so you, we just uh, get the several photos from uh, their um, official pages in some social network. Uh, yeah, and we um, run several, uh, several most important models like scene recognition, object detection, and we uh, face, face clustering. So, for example, in the Rolling Stone example, where there are four uh, faces, uh, four clusters of uh, the main members of the group, uh, and uh, there are some scenes and objects like guitars, uh, playground, and so on. And uh, the same for many other profiles. Yeah, something like uh, for hockey player, yeah, and uh, with some uh, fashions or sport, uh, hockey, uh, some travelers like boats and something like this, uh, some uh, singers, or I don't know how, how to say it, and uh, chefs with food, fast food, pizza, pasta, so some, uh, some, something uh, interesting, and uh, again, sportsmen, so many examples. Actually, it's, it works really nice, so in, in every, um, in, in every of this quality example, there are real, uh, so mm, everything uh, was more or less perfect. Yeah, so it's uh, really easy to understand the preferences of each person here. And actually, we tested it many times on a real mobile device of random users, and again, it really works. Uh, so mm, let me switch to another part. So it's ju it was just an application, and uh, actually it's uh, one of successful applications of how to do it. And uh, let's uh, let's think how to implement it uh, in reality. Um, I will uh, here I provide some uh, some brief uh, review of uh, maybe rather old um, models used to uh, used for. Uh, image recognition on mobile devices, uh, and I hope I will. I won't spend much time. I will only say some important words about some uh, some interesting uh, ideas. Yep. Uh, so uh, actually, everything started by deep neural networks, and the deeper is the better. The uh, the great number of layers you have, the uh, higher accuracy you have. So yeah, some example from Keras, but uh, you can take a look at much larger models from PyTorch. Uh, a team model for a uh, team library, for example, yeah? But you know that uh, if the model is better, uh, is larger, then you get better results. So it's uh, usual. But um, the question, the real question is how to uh, make a lightweight model, but still, uh, which can still work uh, more or less similar to the state of the art state of the art models in terms of accuracy uh, so to sacrifice a bit accuracy but to uh, create lightweight models i mean with uh, small memory uh, consumption and also with uh, good latency yeah and uh, so uh, again uh, it's uh, it was it started i don't know six years ago, so something like this. So first idea was depth-wise separable convolutions. I hope that it's more or less known for every student right now, but I had to, uh, ha had to make this slide because actually it's uh, one of the first time when they uh, think about how to, how to implement convolution uh, uh, efficiently. Um, by the way, um, so, uh, sorry, uh, hop, 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 hop. <laughs> let me return back. Yeah, and just just some example uh, of replacing convolution to uh, the sequence of uh, depth-wise and point-wise convolutions. Um, actually, uh, it's really interesting that though this uh, works particularly well, for example, on mobile devices, um, the latency on GPU of um, original convolution may be uh, maybe better, uh, the latency on GPU may be better because NVIDIA uh, f in their drivers uh, optimized uh, generic convolution much better than uh, point-wise and, and uh, depth-wise convolution. So in, uh, by using the GPUs from NVIDIA and uh, the drivers from NVIDIA, you won't see some uh, brilliant results, I mean, in terms of latency. But when you implement it on mobile device, uh, in which uh, there is no such uh, huge um, uh, optimization of uh, this uh, convolution uh, operation, you will see that the, this trick by uh, replacing this uh, one uh, large convolution with two small uh, different convolution models like depth-wise and point-wise, you will see that it's, uh, it really works. 
Uh, and uh, actually, it, uh, it was an idea of MobileNet V2, V1. It's, uh, the, it was the first model um, especially developed for mobile applications, and actually it's just a sequence of uh, depth-wise and uh, point-wise uh, convolutions with some back batch norm and so, something like this. Uh, so after that, they increase uh, the quality and uh, reduce the size of the model in the second version by using uh, bottleneck residual block because um, at that time ResNets uh, shines. Yeah, so they decided to use some kind of inverted residuals and uh, get some better result when compared to MobileNet V1. Uh, so, I mean, uh, it's, uh, it was faster and uh, you can get uh, better accuracy. And uh, also, there was an important trick at that moment when, you, when they created the squeeze and excitation networks. Uh, so actually, it's a trick to increase the accuracy by um, modifying any model. But uh, after that, they use it to uh, reduce the size uh, of the model and uh, to increase the latency of the model and uh, add this trick to return back to rather high accuracy. Yeah, so and uh, this is some, some kind of scaling and can be implemented to any module like inception or, residu or residual block or something like this. Um, yeah, and uh, right now for sure uh, there are uh, plenty of uh, visual transformers and uh, actually uh, probably you know that it's a rather heavy thing. Um, yeah, so though it can work uh, really nice. And uh, there is a work from, uh, I believe, from Apple, uh, how they implemented mobile visual transformer. And right now there was a mobile visual transformer version 2 or something like this. So actually they uh, combined the convolutions, uh, visual transform, uh, convolutions, transformers, and some other stuff together. Uh, so they didn't rem remove the convolutions completely. So they decided that in some case convolution is okay at the first, uh, at the initial uh, processing, local processing, and after that they use the transformer uh, that works not with the patches of original image, but with uh, the um, but with the with the result of convolution block. Yeah, and actually it really works. So it, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's one of the best models for mobile uh, intelligence, I mean for mobile computer vision. Um, but uh, this is one part, I mean how to, uh, how to create some models suitable for mobile devices. Another one was to optimize existing neural networks. Um, okay, and uh, there are several well-known techniques. I will uh, just um, show them that they exist and they uh, really work in some case. So one of them was knowledge distillation when you train the state-of-the-art deep model and after that you get the uh, mobile model, well, like yeah, mobile net or something like this, and you train it uh, in, uh, you distill the knowledge of deep model to this lightweight model and they show that it's uh, possible to increase the accuracy of this model when compared to the training this model without this teacher. Yeah, so this is a well-known trick. Also, it's, uh, so it's, maybe it's not an optimization of the model, but it really, so it's one of the most popular tricks in uh, mobile uh, computer vision. When you solve several uh, tasks, similar tasks, you can combine them together, yeah, uh, by using uh, the, uh, some shared layers. Uh, so you create the multitask model, and uh, even in my uh, application, I showed it with, uh, for Samsung, we used several uh, uh, multitask models. Uh, one of them was for facial analytics, so it was the same model for extracting facial identity features to recognize faces, yeah, something like embeddings, to predict age, uh, gender, uh, ethnicity, something like this. There was also another model that predicts scene and uh, so-called events. So again, with two heads, and uh, it uh, really uh, works. I mean, you don't need several models, uh, several different models, and uh, it's uh, if your loss in your multitask uh, model is uh, rather smart, you can get uh, good accuracy, and uh, you don't need uh, several models. You can uh, use only one model, yeah, and uh, it really works for facial processing, for image and understanding, or something like this. Um, yeah. Um, also, there is uh, there was in some uh, years it was popular so-called structural pruning when you uh, remove the channels from convolution some some convolution filters. Um, again, so it's not a pruning. I mean pruning of weights, but it's pruning of uh, complete filters. Um, it's uh, it's so you get the model, you prune uh, some. 
uh, unimportant uh, channels. And after that, you tune maybe the model to get the better accuracy. Um, actually, it still works. So it's not the best way to optimize the model, but it's still uh, one, of the, uh, one of the popular uh, things, um, I don't know, yeah, like seven years ago or something like this. Uh, yeah, it, uh, in some case scenario it works, so we implemented it in uh, our uh, in several of our projects, and it even works for mobile nets. But uh, you can't expect that you will get um, drastical improvement of latency in uh, this scenario. So it's some small optimization when all other optimizations doesn't work well. Uh, for sure, there are some quantization tricks. Um, actually, it's a really hard topic to discuss. I just say that it's, uh, it exists, and uh, there are some issues with quantization, I mean with accuracy, and that's all, because there are, right now it's uh, a huge of, uh, theory for quantization. And uh, what's uh, important here, and um, maybe the last uh, part of my uh, rather short presentation, is the usage of uh, neural architecture search uh, to get the best possible model for concrete device. So the first one was uh, NetAdapt uh, network that adapts existing network to some constraints presented in um, for real device. So you have one device, you have a deep model, and you want to optimize it uh, to fit some constraints with latency, with um, memory, uh, and with something like this, and maximize the accuracy. So actually, it was maybe one of the first applications of neural architecture search for mobile uh, for creating mobile. Um, architectures, uh, yeah, and it really works by using some kind of uh, lookup tables. Uh, so you, get, you, you don't run the model each time on your mobile device, you uh, gather uh, the lookup table of uh, typical operations like convolution, batch norm, and something like this, and after that you can uh, summarize the, uh, the latency of each, uh, of each, uh, of each layer. Uh, to get the latency of the whole model. Actually, it works only for CPU of mobile device, but still, it's, it was the first step. After that, they appeared the MNASNet that improved the uh, search by using the reinforcement learning. Uh, they uh, used some uh, smart reward by combining the accuracy with latency together because they need one reward, and we have multi-criteria optimization. We need to uh, improve the latency and also to maximize the accuracy. Um, but, um, it, so, but it worked only for a particular device. So if you have another device, you need to repeat the neural architecture search again. Uh, after that, maybe, I, as far as I remember, in a sequence of time, uh, they appeared the version 3 of MobileNet that combines the neural architecture search, uh, the squeeze and excitation trick I mentioned before, and also some, um, uh, some new nonlinearity functions and uh, activation functions like uh, swish, hard swish, and something like this. So they um, optimized it not for concrete mobile device, but for some flops. I mean, um, some, so it's not optimization for one device, it was optimization for performance at all. And uh, actually, it uh, also was a nice step forward to uh, obtaining a good uh, model. And uh, maybe one of the best models here is EfficientNet. Again, they optimize, so they implemented really smart uh, neural architecture search with uh, something like uh, inspired by MNASNet. Uh, actually, the authors of MNASNet were the authors of EfficientNet. Uh, they uh, provided the uh, scaling of the model, so they trained one of, uh, so they, they get one model, EfficientNet B0, and after that they scale it uh, in compound, uh, in, in some again in some smart way. So I hope everyone knows it and use it, and uh, it's uh, so it's really lightweight model and uh, it really fits well on uh, mobile architectures, and actually it's something like baseline for any new architectures developed for mobile devices. Um, what's uh, also what I want to uh, say finally here, it's a very interesting, from my point of view, paper about once for all networks, so creating the super net, very large net, uh, network like something like here, so you train once, well, so you train one very large network only one time, and after that you can I extract some subnets of that network um, for a particular device. So you have uh, one mobile device with some, uh, I don't know, with Snap, Snapdragon 888. 
uh, yeah, and you want to get the model with some uh, predefined latency and with highest accuracy. You don't need to, tu to train the model uh, from scratch. You don't need to fine tune the model at all. You just extract some subnet of this large supernet, and that's, uh, that's, that works really fast and really nice, so you can get the subnet in uh, several minutes. It, it's um, like it works uh, for, for the first time you think uh, it works like a miracle yeah so you have a really large model and you can adapt it for any device uh, you can get the one of the highest accuracy uh, with a reasonable latency for any device actually we had some project with um, Huawei uh, and uh, which was implemented by improving this model for some devices and uh, yeah actually it really works so our modification really works and it was uh, really interesting so let me show you how, uh, some example of its using for face recognition uh, just training the model uh, for face identification uh, it was a training on VGG phase 2 so something like this when you trained any models from scratch or from pre-trained of ImageNet, you get some not so good accuracies when compared to the state of the art. But if you train the, you know, this SuperNet, even if you extract the very small subnets uh, for a particular device, you get much higher accuracy when compared to these uh, efficient net models or something like this. So it's really interesting. So it's some adaptation to any device. You just need to gather the lookup table from this device and uh, wait for a couple of minutes and get the best possible uh, network for solving the image classification task here. Uh, the efforts of uh, once for all network improved it uh, and combined it with uh, quantization, pruning, and uh, something like this. Um, that just one interesting paper from uh, from the same um, from uh, the same audience. Uh, yeah. So, but actually, uh, this SuperNet is one of the so I mean the tricks with SuperNet are one of the most important right now, I believe. Yeah. So uh, this brings me to conclusion of uh, this talk. So. Uh, Maybe it was too long. Yeah, uh, so actually, uh, computer vision is still, is still under active uh, research. There are plenty of uh, different tricks how to create uh, good architectures, how to optimize existing architectures, how to implement them uh, as fast as possible, how to uh, make them uh, lightweight, and uh, how to uh, make the latency as uh, best as possible. Uh, there are huge optimization of uh, current frameworks. So actually, it's, um, it's really interesting uh, when you take a look at the, uh, at the adaptation of these frameworks. And uh, finally, I should say that uh, though we uh, spoke about um, offline uh, computer vision, uh, don't forget about possibility to use online computer vision if it's possible. Yeah? So in this case, it's much more easy. You don't need to think about anything. You just need to transfer the image to a remote server and use your model that you exist. So if it's possible, then it's maybe it's the best uh, possible solution here. So thanks, everyone. Uh, again, thanks, everyone, for coming here uh, this evening. And if you have some questions, I will be glad to answer right now or maybe um, after official uh, end of the first day. Thanks for a great talk. Uh, first question concerning uh, the uh, structure of the matrix multiplications, usually on mobile devices, uh, it is more beneficial to have a lot of uh, small operation rather than large. For example, efficient net, as far as I remember, when looking at, uh, at the architecture, is quite a deep uh, model with a plenty of layers, but usually their width is not very large compared to uh, VATs, which have relatively small number of operations, but with wide layers. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I completely agree with it. And uh, so you just, uh, so uh, maybe there is some question or what, 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 what so. Uh, uh, question uh, was like uh, the, the CPU as on mobiles are not as bounded by parallelism for efficiency. So therefore we do not need wide models. Uh, actually, again, it's really uh, hot topic for uh, hardware developers. Uh, so mm, um, in, in, in general, oh yeah, uh, in general you are absolutely correct, but you need to think about uh, two 
uh, uh, two, uh, two possibilities. So first of all, many current uh, mobile devices have GPUs or even some kind of neural uh, modules or something like this optimized for particular operations. Yeah, that's uh, the, so like an Apple or something like this, yeah? And uh, in this case, you need to think about what operations are supported right now by this, <laughs> uh, by, by this, uh, by this stuff. And uh, actually, uh, so in general, uh, in, in general still, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, so, you, uh, so, what, 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 so actually, there is no one, answer for <laughs> for very uh, huge number of different architectures. Um, in general, uh, uh, large uh, depth of the model is undesirable, is still undesirable for uh, for CPU processing, because in CPU you process, uh, you, so in general you work uh, layer by layer, and, uh, and, uh, and that's why uh, if you uh, have enough memory to feed the width of each layer, then the number of layers should be not so high, not, not so, so large. But if you have GPU, then the uh, processing uh, is uh, much more complex. And uh, in this case, I can say something, <laughs> something, uh, something uh, new. I mean, it's neat, uh, so you need to you need to test it on uh, each uh, device you are worried about. Uh, and another topic here. So first one is GPU, if it's available or not on your device, and uh, the second one is about the um, process of OSN of int8 computation. So if you, uh, if, you can, if you are lucky enough to quantize your model without sacrificing the accuracy, <laughs> and uh, actually it really depends on the model. So uh, for example, mobile net can be easily quantized. So, and, uh, there is, so you, you don't even need to fine tune it. And uh, if you uh, quantize, for example, efficient net, you lose 20-25% uh, of accuracy, so it uh, doesn't work well, so you need to do some quantization aware training or something like this, but uh, if you get a rather accurate model uh, that works with int8, then uh, it can be implemented really fast, and uh, in this scenario, you can uh, use the CPU and parallelism, and again, you need to fit the width of the layer in, uh, in the memory and uh, minimize the depth of the, of the model. But, so, but in general, you are, you, you are correct. There are some differences, and you need to, uh, and you need to, to experiment, <laughs> as usual. Uh, thanks. And concerning the OFA, one model, uh, how does one extract the smaller model? It's, uh, is it structured pruning of a large model? Um, no, I'm sorry. I, I have only forward. Uh, <laughs> let me show it. Maybe, maybe here, yeah. Uh, so actually it's, um, um, uh, yeah. Um, it's, uh, so the once for all network is a, co a combination of several blocks. Each block can contain, um, I, I, I don't remember right now, from three to five layers or something like this. So, and there are different paths, uh, three layers, four layers, five layers uh, in each block. Uh, so you can, uh, what, what you can optimize during the evolution search yeah, is something like genetic algorithm of something like this. You can optimize uh, the, num the number of layers in each block and uh, also some kind of structural pruning inside each layer. So how, what, what exactly, uh, what, uh, what are exact channels that you need if, you, if it's about uh, something like uh, convolution or something like this. And after that you have some, uh, so you need to train this model uh, for a while, <laughs> for several days at least, uh, because you need to optimize all these paths. Not the best one, but you need to optimize, so you need to think, uh, what, what about if, yeah, if I skip this part of the network? What about this one? I want that all my subnetworks will be rather accurate. And, uh, uh, and uh, so this is not just structural pruning, it's uh, some pruning of layers and structural pruning and uh, some, some smart uh, learning, some smart training of it. Uh, so there are several computational paths which one can take, and some of them provide higher accuracy, uh, but cost more. And we choose uh, the one that satisfies our demands. Uh, yeah, and uh, the main difficulty of training is that you need to, uh, that all different passes will be more or less accurate. So you don't need uh, passes that don't work. <laughs> you will skip mm -hmm. them completely. Yeah, but yeah, 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 still correct.
And uh, one more question uh, <laughs> concerning uh, what uh, does usually one use, uh, ImageNet pre-trained models or self-supervised is now becoming more popular uh, for fine-tuning downstream tasks in Europe? Uh, well, actually, it's, uh, so, um, it really depends on, on the task uh, itself. <laughs> yeah, so, for example, uh, in, uh, uh, in the last day of this conference, I will present my emotional networks that are pre-trained on, not on ImageNet, but on other emotional data sets, yeah, uh, or something like this. But, uh, so, actually, um, from the perspective of mobile development, um, it does not really matter <laughs> how you train the model. If your model is uh, really accurate or it can get uh, good embeddings uh, for downstream tasks. Uh, uh, here, uh, we should focus only about architectures used, to, uh, used in uh, your uh, applications and how to train them. It's your <laughs> it's uh, it, it, it's uh, it's your so it depends on your uh, your mind, your understanding, your uh, your, your your skills in training, uh, semi-supervised, uh, unsupervised, or I don't know, or just fine-tuning the image net. <laughs> Great, thanks. Thank you for a couple of questions. Thanks. Uh, so we meet, uh, we meet tomorrow uh, at uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, so we will have again two lectures. So first lecture by Evgeny Bernayev uh, on optimal transportation, uh, uh, generative modeling based on stochastic processes, and also when after lunch we will have uh, a lecture by uh, Dmitry Vetrov, uh, and uh, so also about generative modeling. Um, so I think uh, this, uh, these topics are like uh, nowadays um, uh, like uh, very, very, like very modern and active topic of research on conferences. So please come. And then at the end of the day, we will have applications in mach of machine learning in physics. So we will be talking by Denis Dirkach and another guy from Moscow State University about applications in astrophysics. So please, please, please come. Okay, then, so that's all for, for today. I caught it bad just today.